So the goal here is to finish The Great Gatsby with some analysis of the last few chapters of the novel, just making sure that we have everything in front of us. So again, take out your notes, make sure you're detailing the things that I'm going over. I'm going to spend a bunch of time on, on some quotations that I think are relevant to the overall development of the novel. As you see me looking to uh, my left, I keep looking at my notes, which I have right here, which are going to be relevant to how I develop all this. So make sure you have your resources. Uh, hopefully you got your multimedia links sent to me. So if you hear my email dinging in the background, it's because several of you are sending me your multimedia links. So here we go with the overall analysis that you need. Good evening, persons of quality. Now, this is chapter seven, and the title slide you just looked at said Tom V. Gatsby, and I think that's important because this is for the conquest of Daisy and why that matters to the overall themes of the novel. So we have Nick Jordan, Gatsby, and Tom all together. Daisy, her eyes meet Gatsby's. There's this instant spark and she declares that she loves him or we at least as an audience know that she has nothing but undying love for Gatsby. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a second. I know we just started, but think about Daisy's intentions. At this phase, chapter seven, we got two more to go. I don't have a whole lot of confidence in Daisy as a character or her intentions or her motives. So for six and a half chapters of the novel, we're looking at Daisy. We use terms like gold digger. We use terms like fraud. And really, I've got some concerns about here in chapter seven, especially when she emotes anything about feeling. So I look at Tom's intentions. He clearly understands that Gatsby is trying to intrude upon his marriage, how he's making a play for Daisy. And Tom, based on everything that we've learned, has no intentions of letting Gatsby get away with any of this. So there's an interesting little scenario that occurs in Chapter 7. Of course, it leads ultimately to crisis. Gatsby and Tom swap cars. So Tom's blue car, I forget what the model is. And then you have Tom, I'm sorry, you have Gatsby's extraordinarily flashy, expensive car. The one that just because it's yellow, it screams money. But it seems like an odd scenario, unless you consider for a second that Tom is manipulating Jay Gatsby to get exactly what he wants in this process. So we don't have any real clear uh, explanation as to why they switch cars. I just, I look at it, I look at it as a large plot device that has significance in the fact that Tom is manipulating Daisy and it really moves, <clears throat> really moves the plot along. So it's never explained why they swap cars. It's a totally random plot device. But what we do know is that Tom has fully discovered the affair and everything we know about his character is going to speak to the fact that he's ultimately going to be in control of this circumstance, which of course, by now you should have figured out that this does not bode well for Jay Gatsby. So I think that's significant. Now there's a little bit, a little, little twist of irony here. And of course it's, what drives the plot is what Fitzgerald does on purpose. So as a seemingly random plot device, Jay Gatsby and Tom Buchanan, each in their own individual cars, stop at Wilson's garage for gas. Just, it's a, it's a clashing, it's an, it's, it's a collision course of two opposite worlds that cannot have anything positive uh, connected to it. So they stop for gas at Wilson's garage. Uh, and again, I wrote Clashing of Universes, and this is absolutely a crisis moment in the novel. Thankfully, we at least waited to chapter seven to be able to develop that particular crisis moment. 
So I think that should absolutely be in your notes as a significant idea that Fitzgerald develops to move the plot. Specifically, when we look at how Fitzgerald moves the plot, examine how he escalates the conflict to a crisis point here. Of course, as we put Tom and Gatsby together, and it's this naked display of machismo, maybe you should look up machismo, M-A-C-H-I-S-M-O, in your notes. This is very significant. And it also happens on the heels of the big reveal of the illicit affair. Where Tom has to come face to face in the same scene with Myrtle and everybody else. I would even be willing to argue that this is directly connected to, to Daisy's transparency. The fact that she's fake. She's shallow, and we know exactly what she's thinking. We've arrived to confront, eh, but not really, the Tom Myrtle affair. Because if Tom has been able to sort of avoid responsibility and avoid real conflict, I don't have a lot of confidence that he's going to find any, any sort of come-to-Jesus moment here in his analysis. What we, do, what we do see, though, in Tom's character is that there's a little collapse for the first time in his strength and in his sort of larger facade. And I wrote, Tom collapses for the first time. Notice how Fitzgerald details how Tom starts to show weakness when he doesn't know what to do while at Wilson's. He's finally going to be confronted about his affair, and this is now going to be hugely significant. He says, and this is Tom says, Tom was feeling the hot wisps of panic. His wife and his mistress, until an hour ago, secure and inviolate, 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 I-N-V-I-O-L-A-T-E. There's no way that they were going to come together. Well, the crisis moment has occurred, and they are now absolutely coming in contact and direct conflict with each other. So, to go back to the beginning of that quote, his wife and his mistress, until an hour ago, secure and inviolate, were slipping precipitously from his control. So he's losing control of the situation, and clearly, Tom's not about that losing of control. So this is not going to end well, and I can see that right here with the description of Tom's character. I'm very, very much a fan, I'm very much a fan of Gatsby quotes and how this works. So I'm going to provide two links on the Mudge page. They're going to take you to lists of significant quotations for Gatsby. So I would suggest you go to the Mudge page, you download them or open them or whatever format I put them in, and make sure you can develop who said it, what's the context, and why is it significant to the overall themes of the novel. I think that's very important to you as an activity moving forward. We understand that the climax comes when Gatsby calls out Daisy to own her truth. My words, but to own her quote-unquote truth. He says, or just tell Tom, or just tell him, the truth, that you never loved him. And it's all gone, and it's all wiped out forever. I had to read my own handwriting. So he says, just tell Tom you never loved him, and it's all wiped out forever. Again, notice the emphasis I'm putting on quotes. It's for the sake of making sure we have the material. So I think this is very important. Gatsby sees this whole Daisy Tom fiasco in black and white. He doesn't see any sort of deviation from his larger plan or from his motives or any of these kinds of things. Perhaps this contributes to his fatal flaw, or tragic flaw, if you will, because he's inflexible. And because he's inflexible, 
he can't adjust to any sort of disruptions to his overall plan. Gatsby sees it as a black and white issue, one of great finality. And that's what it comes from the text. It's it's going to happen this way, and this is going to bring the novel to an end. He only needs Daisy to be able to follow along and play her part in this process. Here's the problem. She can't. She won't. She's incapable of going through any sort of uh, realization of the depth in her character. So I think, again, that's incredibly important. Now, this first segment is at 9 minutes and 44 seconds. If I move on, Gatsby pushes the issue further, stupidly. Bad plan. He looks at her and says, you never loved him. Escalating. Put it down, put it out to the universe so that when you make a choice, or he forces her to make a choice, she doesn't have any other, she has no other options. I mean, look at what she's got going on here. She can pick De Gatsby, the upstart. She can stay stable with Tom. To me, there's no question about the choices Daisy's going to make and how that's going to have a tragic end. So Gatsby pushes her and says, you never loved him. Of course, implied here is that she only loves his money because she's a gold digger what she says about her daughter, all these kinds of things that tie her to the money. So I think this goes to my earlier idea that Daisy is absolutely shallow, transparent, and pale. And I use that language because I used it as quote material earlier to describe Jay Gatsby. So let me try that again because I got some cool notes here. So this goes to my earlier idea that she is shallow, transparent, pale, emotionally, I put that in parentheses and even even more shallow and then I wrote did I say that already did I beat you over the head with the fact that I think she's shallow and transparent and really she's not going to make any large decisions on her own I think very significant something else I find significant when you look at the quotes is Fitzgerald describes Tom as having a husky tenderness. And I put those two words in quote, husky tenderness, in his voice. What, Tom shows emotion? Figure out if you think that this is intentional or not in its presentation. The reason I note it is because this is where Daisy collapses. When Tom reaches out and he seems to have emotion in his voice, Daisy crumbles as a character. And that whole big, I'm going to strike out on my own, I'm going to do all these things, just falls apart at that point. And I know you appreciated that sound effect, but I think it's very important. So again, Tom has a quote-unquote husky tenderness, and this is sort of the first crack in Daisy's character in her facade, F-A-C-A-D-E, in her performance. And she says, you want too much to Gatsby. You want too much. I love you now. Isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. She's done so much damage that now all of a sudden we're going to make it all go away with, but I love you now. Oh, honey, no. That's not going to work for me. This is perhaps why she's one of my least favorite literary characters. Because she is utterly deplorable in the way she presents her character and the way she presents herself. Now I realize that I'm currently at 13 minutes and 24 seconds roughly. I didn't put any breaks into this one because my notes are well organized. So this is just a matter of pacing yourself. You may have to go back a couple of times. Remember, the video is available on YouTube if the play posit shuts you out. So you can go look at that as well. Now, after these big moments, that was my power pause to let you catch your breath. Tom turns on Gatsby. 
crisis moment we've been waiting for. Two dominant males, button heads, there's this significant conflict that occurs. Tom addresses the corruption and the rumors and all of the deceitful, deceitful behavior attached to Gatsby. It's all about Gatsby's reputation. It's all about criticizing where he comes from, criticizing the major ideas. So Tom deliberately ruins Gatsby's golden image. And I use that term golden image on purpose, especially when we look at the ideas of the Gilded Age. So Tom is responsible for revealing the corrupted underside, underbelly, if you will, of the entire novel and all of the rumor and conjecture surrounding Gatsby's character. Of course, we as readers, we know all this because we've read the book. But it's important that the characters now openly face the reality. It's important that the characters openly face the reality of this gilded character. Not the gilded illusion that they've been living under for six and a half chapters. So this is a big reveal here in this particular chapter. As we move, Tom sends Daisy, who's now enraged at having Myrtle and the affair in front of her. Crisis moment, Daisy discovers the affair. Daisy discovers that this is all garbage. She has Tom's illicit behavior thrown in her face and she absolutely rages. And I think that's incredibly significant. Now that she has it in front of her, and as Tom comments, he says, quote unquote, I think he realizes his presumptuous little flirtation is over about Gatsby. As Tom asserts his control and Daisy has to almost instantaneously come to grips with Tom's affair, I think she snaps. In that psychological, I'm having a break and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna rage and I can't be responsible for my actions. I think she absolutely flips. So Tom wins. But if Tom wins and can assert himself over Gatsby, ultimately, where does this, where does this leave Daisy? Broken, alone, shattered, and for a character who was fairly superficial, and to use my word again, shallow, I find this to be incredibly important. So Tom wins. Where does this leave Daisy? Well, here's something to remember. Shakespeare said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Shakespeare said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, now, Daisy is that woman scorned. And I think this absolutely leads to the events of the car accident. The big reveal at the end of the chapter is the accident at Wilson's garage. Of course, we put it there. Of course, we see Wilson who has to deal with the consequences of discovering his dead wife, who's been killed in the car accident. And, oh my God, this is catastrophic and crazy and all these kinds of things. It's revealed that Myrtle was the victim of a hit and run, apparently by a yellow car. And we soon discover that Gatsby was letting Daisy drive. How ironic, what an interesting way to eliminate Myrtle from the appropriate process or from the appropriate scene. If Daisy's driving, if she happens to run Myrtle over in the car, how convenient, purposeful. I would say that given Daisy's character as we know all of these things, absolutely significant. My personal opinion, absolutely, Gatsby, or I'm sorry, Daisy did it on purpose. And Gatsby, yet again, is just a pawn of what Daisy is planning as a character. The big line at the end of the chapter. 
Gatsby. He's stand he's quote unquote standing there in the moonlight. This highlights Gatsby's isolation from everybody else. There's no way that he as a character is going to be able to connect ever back to this universe, especially now that he's implicated in the death of Myrtle. We, of course, know the truth, but again, I find this to be really telling. So if he's tragic, this could be absolutely something that pushes him off the deep end. Now, I wrote three observations here in my notes. So he's standing there in the moonlight. He's alone. He's isolated. No one cares about him. No one is interested in whether or not he reconnects. My notes, I said, he's alone and he's been forsaken by Daisy. Two, he's crushed. He can't contest the outcome. He can't, he can't contest it. He can't control it. He can't do anything. And Gatsby as a character seems to absolutely crumble when he can't control a situation. So I find that to be significant. And I would also make the huge argument that right now he's a tragic character. At the end of chapter seven, he's absolutely a tragic character. He's broken. He's had his Hamartia tragic flaw. He's had his anorisis, perhaps his realization here in chapter seven. I think is very significant. Has he had his catharsis yet? No. That certainly comes at the end of the novel, and I have it in my notes when I finish chapter 9. But absolutely, three takeaways. He's alone, he's crushed, and he's a tragic character. So I think all of these are going to be significant elements at the 21-minute mark. Good luck.